the non-Muslims of this country don't feel safe. I think it was Martin Luther King Jr. who said that for evil to go on, good men will be quiet. And what they are trying to do in this country is to get us to be quiet by intimidation, by different things. But I can't keep quiet. I have tried to keep quiet. I can't keep quiet. I, 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 I was crying in my sleep, literal tears this night. I slept maybe at 3 o'clock today. I, I thought I had... I read something in the afternoon that bothered me all day. And I thought I had silenced it, but it won't go away. And at night, I just found myself crying. I want Mr. President to see this. Because my address is to the President again. My address is to Mr. President. That number one, Nigeria is not an Islamic country. Nigeria is not an Islamic country. Nigeria is a secular state. Nigeria is a secular state. Nigeria is a secular state. It's not an Islamic country. Nigeria has never been and will not be. It will not be in the name of Jesus Christ. There are Muslims in Nigeria. There are Christians in Nigeria. There are Buddhist animists in Nigeria. Nigeria belongs to all of us. And not one religion will be highlighted or, or preferred or, or, or lifted up above the others. And I know we live in a nation of impunity where leaders do what they want because they know we will not say anything. They know we will take it. And so they will keep doing it. But as long as some of us are here, as long as God allows us to be alive because it is God who keeps we will keep speaking. I am still disturbed at, at the silence of Mr. President. Over this mayhem. Over this evil that has overtaken our country. I am disturbed. I can't hold my peace. What is this? That a people can go to a community and wreak havoc. Or as we are sitting here in church. In this AC. Feeling good, praising Jesus and all. There are some people being kidnapped in the bush right now. There are some people being raped by Fulani herdsmen and by, by bandits or whatever you call them. Whoever it is that it has invaded our country is the sole responsibility of Mr. President to control that. Now, I don't care what anybody says, because I know that there are people who will argue and say it's not the president's fault or anything. But to the best of my knowledge, everything that happens on this campus is my responsibility. Everything that happens in this family worship center grounds, in this church, in this ministry, is my responsibility. If it is good, I give it to the people. If it is bad, I carry it. It's my responsibility. Everything that happens in this nation, it's Mr. President. What surprised me, sir, is you've not said anything. You don't say anything. The only time you speak is when iPod does something. But when the other ones do things, we don't hear anything. The particular story I'm going to read this morning, is not, I've not verified it. But it is exactly what happened to somebody in this church. Exactly. In fact, the one in this church... Maybe not as worse, because you can't quantify, you can't grade them. But I'll tell you the little difference between what happened to that person and what I'm about to read. And it's not the first one, it's not the second one. This one just happened to have come to me yesterday, and it gripped my heart, and it, it reminded me of the other ones that I know of. The other ones that I can say, this is, so this person articulated it so well. And it broke my heart. This happened to a Muslim woman. But this is a long story. And I'm going to read it. So this woman came from somewhere. Maybe America. Or London. Or from somewhere outside this country. She's a Nigerian with her husband. Muslim, committed Muslim people. I have tried to hold myself. I can't. So she writes. It took me a long time time of reflection to put this piece together 
First, let me thank my husband for the emotional support, the counseling, and for his belief in the creator of heaven and earth, which we call God or Allah. The journey began in Auji. We traveled to Akure on Monday, stayed with my husband's relations in the outskirts of this ancient town. In the evening on Monday, we visited the palace for dinner. My, my husband being a close friend to the son of the king. On Tuesday, we left for Ibadan via Akure Elisha Road. Our plan was after attending the wedding at Inauchi, we would travel to, with my husband to Lagos, stay for a few weeks before returning abroad, where I, have li I had lived with my husband and children for more than a, de a decade. We were in the care for a, of a close family friend, an accountant who gave his time and energy for our comfort. We were five in the car, my, myself, my husband, and our daughter. A lady who is my husband's niece, who had joined us in Akure with the hope of traveling with us to Lagos. The driver, accountant, maintained a normal speed. He drove professionally. That gave me a lot of comfort, and I felt I could find some time to sleep a bit. My daughter was next to me. She was just nine. Nine years old. She was coming to Nigeria for me, with me for the second time. Shortly after Ijar Ijare Junction, the driver felt the wagon's tires rup rupture and decided to park the car with the hope of changing the tires. It was like a film in a dizzy, motley crowd of armed men in military uniform came out of the bush. They Fired at the boot of the car. Ahead of us, five of them came out of the bush. Another two came from the rear. My daughter screamed, Mommy, Daddy, what's going on? There was no time to say a word. They marched us through into the bush, firing into the sky. They hit me on my chest, hit my daughter on her head. Blood oozed. At this time, it was better to kill me. I shouted at one of the armed men. His response was hell. He went straight for my private part. Tore my dress with his gun. The others ripped my dresses. I was left with my undies. My husband and my daughter started crying. Two of them dug their teeth into my breasts. While attending a secondary school in Adamawa, I had lived with some Fulani, so I understood a few Fulani words. I started pleading, at least for my daughter. To my shock, at gunpoint, they removed the dress of my little girl. <laughs> One of them carried her on his head as a baby, on his head as my baby struggled, shouting, Daddy, Mommy, what's going on? Help me. <sighs> I could not help myself. We marched for nine hours. I was half naked. My daughter was totally naked. Her tears was like a, blood, a stream of blood on her cheeks. Our phones had been seized. We ended up in an ungoverned region in the thick of the forest. We met a well-organized group. There were some kidnapped victims. I saw two women, two ladies and three men. They were, there were some people with their legs chained to, to trees. They were as if half dead. We were separated. I was separated from my husband. My daughter was taken away. I only heard her screaming intermittently. I did not know what they were doing to her. These men, now about two dozen, had a full kitchen. They had a huge camp and a traditional medical team. How can they say they don't know where these people are? How can they say that? <laughs> but the camps appeared isolated from each other. We had noises afar indicating it might be nuclear settlements of camps. Right in my presence, I saw them pack the remains of a woman. They took her and buried her a few meters away from us. She had tribal marks. I cannot describe the agony of, of six days in captivity in this little piece.
I cannot talk about how they asked my husband to choose between being myself being raped or his daughter being raped. My husband broke down in uncontrollable tears. One of them hit him saying, you're a bastard. You they cry, idiot. They now give him an op- they gave him an option that he should be raped by one homosexual among them. My husband, a devout Muslim. My husband is a devout Muslim. He told them that homosexual and rape, homosexual and rape of any kind was against Islam. They hit him with the butt of AK-47. What do you know about Islam? You can imagine you are being asked to choose between being raped by a homosexual, your daughter just nine years old, or your wife being raped. They gave the fourth option. If you fail to choose one, we will rape your daughter, rape you, the man, and rape me, the wife. I myself, the sacrificial, I made myself the sacrificial lamb. My husband begged, <laughs> saying they should name any price. One of them asked him to bend down. Three beastly criminals sat on his back, jumping until he was too weak to stand. I was not allowed to put on any additional clothes. Imagine they, they rape you all night and they stop you from putting on any clothes for 24 hours. The rain fell, the rain fell once. I became a relic at a sexual museum for the armed men to in turn address me and ask questions about my financial standing. New Fulani men joined the camp. They organized military training for the new Fulani men that came teaching them how to shoot and walk through circles of glowing fire they were not released until after six days we were not released until after six days we had to walk the same zigzag journey back to the main road our eyes blindfolded during the negotiation to pay they said the money was not for them alone that they had to settle those who sent them for me i was I see a thriving organized crime supported by powerful political interests. Now, I do not think we were released to freedom after paying a whopping 8 million naira. I do not think we can ever be free. We can never be free from the anguish, the psychological trauma, the nightmares we suffered, the occasional fits of my daughter, her waking up at night behaving strangely, her asking the same question over and over, Mommy! Mommy, why? Why? And I do not have an answer. In my life, I have never passed through a torture chamber like this. I do not think any society should let this happen. I do not know the fate of those we met and about seven other people brought during the six days we were in captivity. What I saw was a nation that has, colla- that has collapsed but pretends she is she lives a people on life support crime is not restricted to fulani people alone we have yoruba criminals but i don't think yoruba criminals are this beastly these elements are savages i can't imagine i can't imagine yoruba thieves going to sokoto or meduguri to kidnap Fulani people and keep them in their own bushes. It gives me mental torture that this is happening and some people are even trying to justify or look for excuses. Well, as a devout Muslim, myself and my family have taken so less in Allah. <laughs> Not the Nigerian police, not the army, not the government. <laughs> we have taken our faith the way it, make, it came. The, our, this is supposed to be faith. <laughs> I thank God that we successfully returned to where we live thousands of miles from Nigeria. We thank God that we have made a vow. Never shall me, any of my children, 
or husband in our lifetime visit Nigeria again. Our remains, anytime we die, will also not be buried in Nigeria. It was a suggestion my daughter made, which we all adopted. I pity the country. I pity her people who continuously walk like the living dead. I pity those who parade themselves as leaders because they know nothing about what is going on and, and, and the abyss the country is sunk already. I pity Yoruba people. Oh, I pity you. I pity my people. For me, the issue is not about President Buhari. Democracy can produce anything, even the worst in the society. What I worry about is the conspiracy of silence by the people themselves. The ignorance, the treachery, and the illusion that one day things will get better through another election. Since I was born in Nigeria, each year had led from bad to worse and on and on. I do not have a solution to what is going on, but I think very soon hell will let loose upon the earth as long as there is no law and order and anarchy and the rule of brutes in the order of the day. Once again, there can never be anything more comforting than my husband who saw what I went through but was able to exchange me, to encourage me and even encourage me to write this little piece after months of agony and sociological imbalance. Good night, Nigerians. I told you that there was a little difference between this, great, this particular case and the person in our church that this happened to. After a lot of them sexually did whatever they did, she started bleeding. They took sand and shoved and, and pumped into her to stop the bleeding. So this, I'm, I'm, I'm not reading what I haven't heard. I'm just glad that these people articulated their own. Mr. President, sir, this is the country that millions joyfully gave over to you. The blood of every child, every man, 